Hello and welcome to season two of Performance People with me, Georgie. And me, Ben. Our guests this time round have 38 Olympic or Paralympic medals between them, 22 of them gold. There are countless world records, 16 Everest summits, and the man responsible for some of the greatest inventions of our time. And alongside them are their closest confidence. They will share what drives these exceptional individuals to their highest heights. Performance People is free on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, YouTube, or wherever you get your podcasts. And don't forget, you can also follow us on our Performance People social channels. Now enjoy this week's episode. Joining us on today's Performance People are a British pair who recently made headlines worldwide with their BAFTA and Oscar winning film All Quiet on the Western Front. Leslie Patterson is a world champion triathlete. She's also a screenwriter and a film producer. Joining her is her husband, Dr. Simon Marshall, a world renowned performance psychologist. Well, these two performance people have been busy conquering the world of sports and they now have their sights firmly set on Hollywood too. What makes me feel like an insider is how strong my why is. And as long as I am passionate about where I'm going, the stories I'm telling and what I'm doing, I will always be on the inside. You know, it's funny because you come from sport, which is a failure-based business, right, essentially. And so you go into another business where it's also a failure-based business, but this time you don't get that objective. You're either fast enough or you're not. You don't get no's very often. You just don't get yeses. Well, this is a completely new version of a Performance People podcast because um, for once, my husband's not at my side, guys. He happens to be on the other side of the world, quite literally, in New Zealand, in Christchurch, prepping for a Cell GP event this weekend. And you two are in LA, so we are a proper worldwide event <laughs> taking place this evening. What time is it with you? It's, it's 7 p.m. with me. What is it with you? It's noon. Uh, it's lunchtime, it? lunchtime, which yeah. means I'm hungry. <laughs> I'm <just kidding. laughs> And She's Ben, for been you, on the what time three is hours, it? So. <laughs> Breakfast time. I'm hungry oh, too. God. And Excellent. it's dinner time here. Good main so I'm starving. Light. Yeah, yeah, good. Okay, um, Leslie, first, I mean, oh my goodness, congratulations on everything that has just happened. I mean, what a phenomenal time you two have been having of it lately. It's just absolutely brilliant. And we'll get well and truly stuck into that. First, though, I want us to share Tom Cruise stories. That's what I want us to do first up. <laughs> So you tell me yours and I'll tell you mine. <laughs> so um, we were attending the nominees luncheon, which is kind of a big deal when you're nominated for an Academy Award because it's the one chance you get to really mingle with the big stars and all of your idols and really just have the time to chat without all of the press being there and it being a big to-do. So, um, of course, Tom Cruise was nominated as a producer for um, for Top Gun. And so he came to the luncheon, which was was quite funny, actually, because, of you know, there was a lot of pictures being taken and people running after him. And I managed to find a, a free spot uh, where I went up to him and I said, Hi, Tom, my name's Leslie Patterson. I'm one of the writers of All Quiet. He said, I know your story. He said, how many hours a day do you train? Um, so, of course, I got very tongue-tied, not expecting at all he would know who I was. And, um, <clears throat> yeah, just said, oh, you know, I have to train about three or four hours every morning. He said, me too, me too. He said, it doesn't matter what I'm doing. I, um, I, I still managed to fit my training in. So that was our little bonding moment. And then he was off uh, being bombarded by a million other people. See, this is the problem because we probably, I think we're of a similar age and we probably both grew up on sort of Top Gun, Jerry Maguire, Risky Business, Cocktail, all of those. So for us, he is this ultimate Hollywood megastar, isn't he? He just, he has that persona and that character. Ben and I um, had the fortune of bumping into him at Wimbledon um, last year at the tennis championships. And um, do you want to tell the story or shall I tell the story, Ben? <laughs> I, I still can't quite get over it, so I think you better tell it. <laughs> no, well, what happened was is there was a collective group of people that obviously wanted to have their photo taken. And I was a bit like, oh, this is a bit cringe. Let's not go down that road. And then before I knew it, I was in the line where that was taking place, and I couldn't really back out because at that moment it would have been probably perceived to be quite rude. So I kept going, and unbeknownst to me, that also in that line and alongside me was going to be Ben and another sort of sailing hero of Ben's, a chap called Russell Coots. 
and um, who's won the America's Cup countless times. And so we find ourselves in this lineup with Tom Cruise and there's sort of me standing on the left-hand side, then there's Tom and the top, see, we know each other so well now, then Tom and then there's Ben and Russell. And um, we had our photo taken and we sort of parked that moment and all were pleasant and then walked away from the moment. And um, it was some weeks later when we were back at my mum and dad's in Hertfordshire in the countryside. And um, Ben looked over at the fireplace and thought, what is that? And um, mum, I'd sent her the photo, obviously, of, of us with Tom Cruise. And um, she'd cut out Ben and Russell Coots to one side of the photo and framed Tom and I. <laughs> positioned it oh, really neatly hilarious. on the fireplace and um ben's never forgiven her ever since so that's our tom cruise moment but you know that's as far as it goes <laughs> oh my the, gosh well i tell yeah. you what he just he he loves athletes he loves the pursuit of excellence he loves anybody that's driven i think so if i get the opportunity to meet him again i'd definitely dig into the to that whole side of his training, how he still recovers mm-hmm. from things, what he does. And I think I think you could really connect, you know, beyond the, the surface stuff. We're holding out that hope, for sure. We are. Um, <laughs> let's talk about you, though, driven by all of these crazy things and, and, and what's, what's happened in the last few months. I mean, it's been the most tremendous, tremendous ride, hasn't it? What was it like turning up at the Oscars, being at a place where you say yourself, you worked there some years ago um, as a waitress. So what was it like turning up, you know, in a completely different way and experiencing that whole event? Hey, well, it was bloody painful. I was in high heels since when I can have imagine. I been used to that? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you know, it was really surreal. I mean, we'd had a couple of months of of sort of meeting people and getting used to events and, of course, the BAFTAs uh, and whatnot. So to some extent, we were a little bit prepped. But it's so huge and it's such an orchestration that you're just kind of overwhelmed the whole time in terms of the stimulus. But it's also like you know there's a lot of waiting around there's a lot of you got to go here and then you got to go there and then there's a red carpet and mm-hmm. all the while of course certainly being an athlete you're getting nervous and it feels like race prep so one thing before a big event for me is I find it really difficult to engage with people and be present um, when I get nervous and so certainly you know that's not something I wouldn't be all gregarious and outgoing but yet that's what you have to be because you're in this new environment where you're having to be in front of press and cameras and really chitty chat. So um, the whole evening in general was a very bizarre, you know, up and down of emotions. It was probably the most extreme thing I've ever experienced in that regard, because, again, you know, the main thing I have to compare it to is is a race. And certainly when, you know, there was amazing things that happened in the night. We won four Oscars for a film. We won Best International Film. But, of course, we lost for Best Adapted Screenplay. And so you're, like, juggling. We didn't lose. We just didn't win. Yeah, exactly. Okay. You didn't lose. That's so, so Californian of you, Simon. <laughs> um, but, uh, but, but, yeah, so you're, like, you're just juggling these extreme emotions. And in a race, of course, you have time to get used to or at least you can determine the output to uh, the, the outcome to a certain extent because mm. you know you can try harder you can do this you can do that you had no control over this and then you had to accept it in a millisecond and you know oh yeah and all these cameras are on you and oh yeah you're at this time of a lifetime and you need to be present and enjoy it and you know meet all these people that you might never get to meet again <laughs> uh, ah, it was uh, it was quite a stressful experience <laughs> very and, everyone and still always keeps says, smiling. Yeah, everyone always says to you, don't they? You should really, you know, with, with a wedding or something, you should really just take moment to sort of take stock and take yourself out of the moment and just enjoy it. And you're like, well, when is that ever going to bloody happen during your own wedding? Because you're yeah. so busy and I think it's milling around. To and, do. Yeah, exactly. So, I mean, Simon, in, you know, you're you're obviously the other half here and, and the performance psychologist too. So you're playing these double roles. And, and so what are you <laughs> saying to Leslie during this time to sort of, so that you just both enjoy this moment because it's so special, but of course it's over so quickly as well. Yeah, I mean, it's funny because I, you watch as Leslie slips into her pre-race routine, right, which is 
yeah. not necessarily the same thing that you would do in film. You, she disappears into this alter ego that she has that she races under. <laughs> it's a whole other story. Um, but you can just see it, her eyes, that sort of look that is not at anything. It's through you. It's a side. And she's just getting very focused. That's how she copes with it. And, of course, we the decision had already been made. In fact, when we were lining up to get into the final ballroom, the guy next to us had the briefcase with all of the envelopes in them. And so wow. um, it was really bizarre to think that the fate has already been decided and you're going in. And of course, then the anticipation is, you know, through the roof. Um, so it was just a question of saying, listen, nothing we do now will make any difference to the outcome. Nothing. Um, of course, in the moment, it doesn't really help because, you know, anyone who says enjoy it in the moment, they're either not had that experience or you have that with hindsight, right? In the moment, it's really difficult to do that because all your attentional biochemical processes are screaming at you to fight or flight response, right? So it's really difficult to stay present. But one of, one of the best things, though, about Sai, because we now write and produce together and, and he played a big role uh, in terms of writing, actually, on All Quiet, he was uncredited for that because he was largely in academia at the time. But because we are now doing this together, the first thing he said is he turned to me and he said, don't you worry, we're going to be here together on that stage like instantly and he looked mm -hmm. at me with such genuine enthusiasm and I was like it was exactly what I needed to hear in the moment and this is something that you know he's been there throughout oh my little baby he's been there throughout my athletic career in the same way right more <laughs> more <laughs> yeah um so you know it really it really is teamwork throughout this entire thing and you know, that's been the journey my whole life. I've always surrounded myself by family and friends and then I'm there to support them too. And that's how I think you get success in the end. Just give me a little bit of gossip from the Vanity Fair party. What's that like for somebody that's never been to one? I'd, I'd just like to be a fly on the wall for about five seconds. I'm not sure I could take eight hours of it. I'd just like five seconds or so <laughs> of it. Honestly, it's like what is very surreal is... is every single corner that you're in or person that you turn to is someone that's famous or someone that you've seen a million times before. So you actually get kind of blasé about it. Um, and again, I've had many of these events to get used to that. You know, it's like, oh, there's Kate Blanchett who's waving at me and coming for a hug. And oh, there's Florence Pugh who loves her film. And oh, there's so-and-so. And, there's James you know, Corden. And yeah, and it was just, you know... Uh, but, but again, you kind of get blasé mm -hmm. after you've done a few of these. And what you realise is they're all just, for the most part, they're actually very normal people that are super grounded, lovely, genuine. Mm -hmm. And the thing that's gotten them there is that mastery of craft and that obsession on their passion and what it is that they do. So that's what you all share in common, actually. And so if you can just be mega... A, a genuine and authentic then that's very appealing because I'm sure they just get over the whole oh my god it's you because I you know to a very small extent I can get that way with me I'm like just talk to me I'm a normal person just have a chat you know um, I think I think that's the so, thing that's so yeah, appealing so about both of you you're so refreshing in that in that in that sort of world which can be I mean Ben and I have dipped ever so slightly a, a very small left toe into you know various parts and, and and facets of that world and it can just be everyone's so nice to everyone and it's all very sugary sweet and actually you just want someone to be blatantly honest and if they don't want you for a job just to say sorry no the answer's no as opposed to oh we'll call you next week it was a great interview you just want that sort of honesty I mean you you two in this world I mean how are you navigating that because it can it can be very very sugary sweet can't it I think I think it's really really tough you know it's funny because you come from sport which is a failure based business yes. right Re essentially um so your relationship with failure or feedback or however one want to couch it is already fairly well it should be by this point anyway being in it as long as we have uh, fairly somewhat healthy and so you go into another business where it's also a failure based business but this time you don't get that objective you're either fast enough or you're not you don't get no's very often. You just don't get yeses because no one, the industry generally works on, no one wants their job to be defined by I passed on the Beatles or I turned down J.K. Rowling's next book. So you get this sort of weird dance around 
no. <laughs> And, and, and coming from the UK or coming from another industry and coming from, especially being married to a Scott, who's the straight talker, you know, she'll <laughs> call it like it is every single time. And it's a strange industry. But I think once you figure that out, it becomes a little bit easier to do that. And I think that the, uh, the training in sport and mine just helping a gazillion athletes who are competing at that level, you realize that the the psychology behind it is the same. Everyone has the same insecurities, or not the same. Everyone has insecurities. Everyone is trying to ultimately don't hates rejection. Everyone wants to be beloved by their peers. And so it's still the same DNA, right, behind all of this, whether you're well known to millions of people or you're, you know, you're holding a boom mic and no one knows who you are, but you're in the industry. It's the same stuff. And that's probably been the biggest realization for us. <laughs> mm. I just wanted to ask, going back to the, the Oscars night itself, you know, did you on that point did you was it interesting did you see that vulnerability in in some of the people that uh you know very famous people but suddenly yes. they're under under the pressure as well did you yep. did that, that come across yeah definitely so after 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 our category I, i'd gone to the toilet and you only have a certain amount of time so you can't really make it to the toilet and back again before they shut the auditorium for the next section and so i was standing outside uh, and they have a television and you can watch it um, and I was standing beside Mark, Martin McDonough and uh, Phoebe Waller-Bridge because um, they're a couple. And I knew Martin already from kind of the circuit and he's absolutely lovely. And I just turned to him and I said, this is really hard. And he said, I've been nominated three times. I've lost three times. Let me tell you, I know how it feels. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it was really lovely to kind of have that interaction. Um you know, and everyone, everyone was was very genuine about it. I think maybe it's probably the har the hardest for the actors, probably. Um, but you know, you just have to, I guess, be honest about it. You know, there was many tears mm -hmm. the next morning. I talked to people about it, but then at the same breath, you have to sort of be very grateful for having a film made, which is mm -hmm. virtually impossible for having a good film made, and then a film that goes on to get garner this kind of attention. And what it is. I think you always kind of come around to the work itself and what drew you into this industry. And Simon and I are so passionate about our mm -hmm. craft and telling stories and having an impact with the stories that we tell. This has now given us an opportunity and it's opened doors and mm -hmm. we're now having great meetings. And we have lots of wonderful things in our future. So, and this is a start for us. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what an amazing start. So you, it takes a few days, but then you find the positives in mm -hmm. that and you find a way to kind of repivot it and say, okay, you know what, I'm going to be that, you know, we're going to be back there again. Yeah. And, and, I do, and I think that, you know, particularly because film is, well, all the arts, they're subjective experiences, right? What's good and bad or welcome, unlike sport, um, and so what the senses that, that of the, the people who have kind of been at that level have really sense, said is that, you know, getting nominated, I know this is probably a rationalization as well for not winning, but this is, this is, I think this is true. And this is how they tend to think of it. And they told us about it is that getting nominated is really the award who wins out of those nominees. It becomes a sort of a popularity contest. There's a whole host of reasons that go in to why, you know, you like that wine over that wine or that piece of art over that piece of art. And then there's no film in any of the nominee categories that, of the nominees that is bad or they're all incredible films that have been elected there by their peers. And so that really is the, and you, and you get that, you know, nom, Oscar nominated writer, you have that, that uh, moniker for the rest of your life. And so it's a really, it's a privilege and you've got to kind of not get too, absorbed and down in that moment because it really is quite incredible so we are now coming out of that little oh, we didn't, oh. <laughs> and now we're kind of on the other side of it i mean guys oh, you won like seven baftas and four oscars and we're talking like there was a loss here i mean i know i know i know that there was this moment that you absolutely of course you wanted to win adapted screenplay and i completely understand but isn't it fascinating the psychology of this because we're talking about it and leslie i remember seeing your bbc interview the next morning and you used the word gutted and i thought that says so much about who you are as perfectionists as people and <laughs> what you want to really achieve that you would use such a word in the context 
context of what you have achieved. Um, and I suppose that also comes a little bit, and I suppose you can tell us more about this, but from this sport background that you have, because we do live, I mean, Ben and I absolutely live in that world, he more than I so, but because I'm his partner, that that does flow over into this, um, you know, the, the f driven by this sort of need not to fail, this, this real compulsion to, it's not really mm. about the winning, it's more about the not failing at a thing. Um, is, is, that, is yeah. that the same thing that you both feel? Do you, does that resonate with you? Yeah, definitely. I think it's um, just that mark of approval that you've that you've achieved some sense of greatness. Um, I think uh, is 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 a big thing, and probably for this award specifically, it's more about what it allows you to do in the future, because we've been on the outside for so long. And it really is that kind of industry. When you're on the outside, you're on the outside, and it is impossible mm -hmm. to penetrate. And once you're on the inside, all of these doors suddenly fly open for a short amount of time until you prove yourself again. And, you know, yeah, you're sort of thinking, well, hey, listen, if I'd won that, you know, mm -hmm. that, that would have bumped us up even more. Um, so I think it's more about the opportunities that it allows you to give because you get scared. You get scared that the door is going to close and you're going to be back to where you were before thinking, how do I get in? Um, it's, it's the weirdest industry. How mm. comfortable are you going to feel with being on the inside? You talk a lot about growing up and feeling a little bit on the outside and being the sort of girl in a team of rugby boys and, and being the only girl in that team that ended up winning the Scottish Championships at 10 years old and then not having an outlet as a girl to continue doing that. So you, to me, are like this absolute rallying for the, you know, the everyman person. So what's it going to feel like to be on the inside? Is that going to feel strange? You're going to have to keep reminding yourself of who you are. Do you know what? I'm really comfortable with it now, and I think that that's taken years to get to that this place, because mm. being on the inside and being really around the top people in the business, what I realise the most is their excellence in their craft, their passion and their drive to tell amazing stories, to make amazing films. It all, it all boils down to their why. And so what makes me feel like an insider is how strong my why is, rather than my status. So, you know, mm -hmm. that's how I feel comfortable. And as long as I am passionate about where I'm going, the stories I'm telling and what I'm doing, I will always be in the inside. Mm -hmm. So, um, and I think that, projects a certain amount of confidence not arrogance because I've got so much to learn Simon and I both do but that's what I love I love to learn so I don't care I'll happily say I don't know I don't have a bloody clue or oh my god I have a great idea or oh god I'm having a really crap day and I, I just nothing's coming to me on this whatsoever because that authenticity of vulnerability allows you to sort of mm -hmm. excel um yeah, so I think I'm at the point in my life and, you know, I'm in my 40s size in his 50s. We've had previous careers. So it's like, I don't think I can be much lower than I've been um, or that much higher and everything in between. All I care about now and all I think we care about is finding amazing people to collaborate with and having experiences. Life is experiences. Um, you know, I want to be in different parts of the world, working with different crew and different producers and directors and maybe even directing ourselves down mm -hmm. the line. And, you know, there's all these exciting things. So, yeah, I, I think maybe that's what appeals to people about my personality is I kind of lay it on the table and I'm not, I don't really care, like, what you think of me anymore. <laughs> you know, um, not to say that I don't Mm -hmm. care like I respect your opinion and I want to listen to people if they have constructive criticism I don't mean that but I just I kind of know who I am inside myself um and you know I think as well if you act this business can be uh, dishonorable there's a lot of uh, mm -hmm. issues with that and the way that people treat other people so I think if you stay true to being honorable to other people helping other people uh, that's a huge passion of mine, people that are on the outside, you know, f forming a team to really sort of mentor other people 
in the ways that mm-hmm, I didn't mm-hmm, have, mm-hmm. then it, it all comes full circle. Mm-hmm. Can I uh, can I ask you a question? I, I'd be great to hear, hear a little bit more about your your f- future plans. But just on the point, I mean, this is obviously performance people podcast, and some of those challenges you were talking about. And I know you've written the book on the on the sports psychology. But can you talk a little bit about some of the techniques that you you might use? Someone listening to this podcast might use on the back of some of the challenges you've been through. Maybe I can start just with a, mm-hmm. a, a general where you kind of stick your flag in the sand for any performance, which is this growth mindset. I'm sure you're familiar with this. And this stems from the psychological work of a few researchers, Cal Dweck, among others. And it's the, the notion simply that how you think about abilities or talents, they're not fixed in time. They're sort of fairly flowing moving targets and so when you try and get into this the wonders of this sort of beginner mindset I'm not good at this yet and it's the yet part that's really important for how you tackle things because many people just give up too far too easily their resilience and there's lots of reasons we can talk a whole hours on why that is but suffice to say that just people quit too easily they don't they get one piece of negative feedback or bad news or setback and you go down this ego protecting spiral and really the secret well it's not really a secret but the the challenge is to overcome that and just to get up and keep going regardless and so and with this notion that I'm not good at this yet and it's funny because talent as we've all known is not the driving force of success it's you know talent plus persistence plus opportunity and the rest of it so and I think when you take that mindset that you can always improve and always get better uh, which we've done in sport and I've done in psychology, I think that looking at it all through that lens does help you figure, oh my God, I've looked at this show or we watched this, it would never be as good as that. They're so talented. And that is a dangerous game to play. Mm. Um, so that's probably the growth mindset is absolutely critical. Mm. One of the biggest things that Sai taught me when I was an athlete and dealing with a lot of hard days, dealing with things like Lyme disease and injury and trauma um, was the part of your brain that processes physical and emotional pain called the anterior cingulate cortex? Is that right? Oh, look at you! Thank you very much. <laughs> she was um, <laughs> and it sits behind your eyes, <laughs> and it actually grows and it gets more dense uh, as you deal with adversity and you know bounce back from it. And so, as soon as I sort of gave it this physical presence in my body, almost like a muscle that I'm working out. I look to tough situations as an opportunity to get stronger, just like I would, you know, the overload principle in training. So I think for me, that really gave me something tangible to, to, to fix on to. And then also as well, Viktor Frankl is a huge inspiration for both Simon and myself. I've come to it later in life, uh, but gravitated towards any kind of suffering as a way to understanding myself, um, you know, and, and finding purpose and meaning. I've spent my life doing that from a very young age. I loved pain and suffering. I, I just did, you know, whether it was in the mountains of Scotland or being the only girl on an all-boys team, I sought it out for a reason. Um, what did so, it give you, you know, Leslie? We, what, did we, it, we sat- what did that give you? What did that give you, that pain and suffering that you felt that you needed that in your life? What were you looking for? I, th- I think I was looking for purpose and meaning, ultimately. You know, even at a young age... I was looking for my place in the world. How did I fit in? What could I learn about myself? I was looking for some kind of deeper understanding uh, of where we're all at. Um, And and again, I mean, I I remember just profoundly being moved running up through the mountains in Scotland at a very young age. And I struggled to fit in, you know, with the girls and what have you in in the traditional ways of doing things. I was very much you know, a contrarian. I did not like shopping, I, you know, or, or sort of boyfriends or painting nails or getting drunk. I always wanted to do the opposite. And I was a very driven, committed, goal-oriented person. So um, I wrestled with that. Like, why was that? My hours spent sort of suffering allowed deeper introspection into sort of who I was, I guess, and the darker sides of myself and the lighter sides of myself. Um, because pain gives you... Pain opens up vulnerability, and through that vulnerability c- comes some kind of beauty, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, you know. Uh, and and certainly coming, being Scottish, being British, you know, we're not as open with our emotions often. 
and yet I'm a very emotional person. And it's, re- it's really actually curious because I think about it a lot in terms of my upbringing. My mum was a very emotional person, always crying, and I find that really difficult to be around. And then my dad was the absolute opposite and would get very frustrated with her. And so throughout my athletic career, my dad used to always say, you're too emotional, Leslie. So I think I quashed a lot of that. And yet, and yet my art allowed me to fulfill that emotionality. Um, so, you know, I both use sport to calm me down and neutralise my over-emotionality. Um, but then also it's a way to feel. Mm-hmm. So it's like mm-hmm. a weird kind of, yeah, juxtaposition for me. Mm-hmm. that's really interesting isn't it actually when you look at different people's experiences and what gets them to the place that they're they're at in terms of your journey that you've been on to get this film made I mean you talked in an interview when I was doing some um, research on this that you're an impatient person how can you be an impatient person this took 16 years to get it to where you wanted it to be I mean that takes extreme patience and resilience and determination and all those things combined I mean what was that journey like that you went on I mean Simon were there times where you thought oh Jesus Christ this is just too much like hard work or did you just <laughs> always just have that thing of whatever happens here this is gonna get made this is an absolute focus for us both well, I think that, you know, when you first start off in when we got the option in 2006 and it's, it's, it felt like a bit of a coup to get such a big title to no name yeah. writers. And so we felt excited. And this is the start. Of course, there's a lot of naivety and ignorance around why hadn't anyone done this before? <laughs> that was the first <laughs> clue. right? Now, um, you know, <laughs> but then. I, Right. So then as we went on, uh, of course, uh, you know, I'm always looking at life through these psychological lenses. And so you have these sunk costs, right? You invest in time and money into this option. And as the years tick by, it becomes harder and harder to quit. This is the gambler's fallacy, right? It's because you, you, you've you got so much in. And if we pull You're out now, everything yeah. is gone. Everything is gone. And so you stay in for the long haul. Um, and my, I wavered sort of around year 10. I was like, oh my gosh, you know, we're not wealthy people. And we're like, is this worth it? And then I think what we came to the conclusion, uh, was, and the, the subtext of that is Leslie came to the conclusion and then convinced me. And then I believed it too. Um, is that, uh, Sounds firstly, familiar. I, think, <laughs> I think, I think it's firstly that, um, you know, people invest a lot of money or spend a lot of money on their hobbies or their passions. And fortunately for us, sport has always been one. And we've been in the really lucky position that we haven't had to pay for much of that, either through sponsorships or yeah. something. So we didn't, re- we had no children or pets. And so we didn't really have much to, that we like to spend our money. We love traveling, but we love the work. And I, so I think that for us, that kept us going as well. We justified it on that. Listen, whether this turns into whatever it does it's both an enjoyable experience it's given us this wild ride with some crazy stories along the way and there's always the promise of something right it's the expectation it might happen it's hope it's hope uh and that kind of kept us in and so yeah we we sort of found this relationship with it but we did the project did have nine lives you know the number of times that it was almost dead in the water and then salvaged you know given cpr because a producer came out of the woodwork or so on or it was quite incredible. And so now when we look back on it, it seems like madness. But at the yeah. time, you're just, oh, it's just this now. What do we do next? And so for Leslie's patience, mm. she, okay. is, she is impatient. But here's, I think, how, let me see if you mm. agree with this, because the way that she deals with it was not so much, she didn't see it like patience. She said, okay, that's a no. What's next? So it was always goal-driven. You're moving the goalposts or you're, you're just keeping yeah. focused on the horizon. And so that looks like patience, but it really isn't because you're just going, no, next, next, next. If you keep doing that, your impatience actually is getting mm-hmm. you through the 16 years. Be a full <laughs> yeah. oh, she she's just going to find a way years. around it, right? She's just going to find a way around around. She is. She's the most driven I, person I've ever met. I do. And I mean, I've been the same in my athletic career. You know, when I've been injured, when I've been sick, I've found ways to get it done whether that's, you know, hopping on the right leg because I can't use the left or swimming one-armed or, you know, doing just ridiculous things. But I, I, I kind of get a kick out of that. Um, but I think, again, if you're, if you're driven by your why and your passion, right, I only would have to go and see a beautiful film in a theatre and be moved to, to tears to think this is worth fighting for because... When we spent almost a year researching, you know, in order to to write the screenplay, adapt the the book, 
we dug into things like trench war diaries, uh, you know, the historical context, the war in general, which is the most devastating episode across the last, you know, several de- you know, several hundreds of years. And to to hear about all of these men and to really just jump into that world, you know, we 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 felt it was important to, to tell this story. We really did in mm-hmm. in a in a modern time frame, in a modern for a modern mm-hmm. audience. It feels like it's hugely important to tell it. I watched it again this morning, um, and it's it's the naivety of youth and the horror of war and the sort of and that that whole play on the human spirit being slowly eroded that you re- it is like an incredibly connected piece that really does it's incredibly moving and it's one of those films that you take away and you you keep replaying it you keep thinking about it again and again in, in and different mm-hmm. parts of it and different you know um thoughts come to you about you know what that would have mm-hmm. been like in that time and 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 how it would have been and i even just recall speaking and i suppose there's many people who have this experience but speaking to grandparents or great grandparents who didn't who never wanted to ever talk about the war and never wanted to discuss mm-hmm. it whether it be world war 2 or world war 1 and now you sort of went with these films like 1917 saving private ryan your film you you can really see why that would be. I mean, you really can get a glimpse mm-hmm. of that, and to see it from a perspective which was a German perspective was so refreshing. Because, like you've said before, I think you never really get to hear that story. The story that you always hear is the one, the history being written by the victors, isn't it? So to hear it from a different perspective mm-hmm. is is again truly fascinating. And I guess that's why you felt it was really important to tell it. Yeah, I mean, right from the beginning. There was a couple of bigger, bigger themes that that really struck out to us. Um, one of which was that betrayal of a youthful generation, yeah, uh, by the upper brass. You know, just that mm-hmm. every man being manipulated, because especially being Scottish and sort of that underdog fight in me, like I that that really resonated. Um, and then you know mm-hmm. I feel like we're so polarized with our thinking now. We never. Uh, uh, put ourselves in other shoes everything's black or white we're siloed in our thought mm-hmm. patterns and our narratives and to tell it from mm-hmm. the other side and to have humanity in that is such a powerful powerful message needed now more than ever and you know that that was also something in this journey that we couldn't have anticipated was the trajectory of how it was going to come together because you know really 16 years ago we couldn't have done a German speaking war film and actually gotten finance for it because foreign films just couldn't support, you know, in the marketplace the way that it can now because of streamers and, you know, uh, films like Parasite winning for best picture and best foreign. Mm -hmm. Um, And World War One was not a popular war to cover 16 years ago because everything was American centric in terms of cinema. And of course, America did not play a large role. So everything was World War Two. So, Mm -hmm. You know, timing is everything in this industry in terms of the impact that you potentially can have. And so when Ed and Malta, our producer and director, came along and said, we'd love to do this in German speaking language film, it just made perfect sense. And it was a perfect timing for it as well. And what Ed did, um, because he's a co-writer as well, he infused it with this German sensibility that is so profound and such a wonderful thing to be a part of to try and understand someone else's culture that you had never been aware of before and one of the biggest things for him was that that Germans feel this huge sense of shame about the wars um given their history and also that there Mm -hmm. cannot be a hero in their war films and I'd never considered that before Mm -hmm. as a British person always kind of really being on the on the winner's side Mm -hmm. but but furthermore, through our research, really understanding, because we're not taught this, what we did to Germany, you know, what we forced them to pay in the reparations and the impact that that had. Now, it's not to say that Germany weren't at fault. Of course they were. But but what does that tell us about how we treat our enemies? Um, and can that be a message? Can that raise a discourse for our future? Mm-hmm. And these are all important things for Simon and I moving forward in terms of the stories that we want to tell mm-hmm. and the impact that we want to have. It always starts with a foundational, greater thematic essence 
a question, a statement, something that we want to raise that can relate to the issues mm -hmm. that are going on in today's society or for us personally that other people could relate to. And I think this is what, when you go into film pitch meetings or you meet with executives or studios, you obviously have the question of what's, what's it about, what's your film about, or what's your pitch about. And then you'll get a second, usually a follow-up question, but what's it really about, you know? And that can often take you off guard because you're like, well, I've explained the plot and the characters. No, but what's the... And really what they're getting at uh, is the underlying sort of moral, thematic spine of the story that hopefully not just generalises to people outside of people who have experience of what you're filming, but it's about um, something that really goes across sort of culture and is contemporary as well. So having some humility, having some sense that we're all sort of victims, I mean, in terms of those soldiers on both sides, um, that there are egos at play on both sides. Uh, there's no right, you know, good, bad, evil, you know, great. Uh, heroes are not like that. All of our heroes are flawed anyway. Um, and so is that, I think, really does resonate. So any story that we get attracted to, we try and unpack it right down to the bare bones of what's this really about. Uh, and so with no mention of the story at all, could you really tell us in a nutshell what this sort of moral question you're as asking and then what your answer is to it in the film? And I think that's a really good place to start from because that drives how your characters act. They take light as you start writing. They become like they, they actually step out of the page and tell you what they should be doing next because you spend so much time with them in your heads, right? So they start to dictate the story as well a little. So I think if you don't have that thematic spine underneath what it's really about, it's really hard to do that. You just end up with a plot-based, a plotty script that you forget about within three minutes of leaving the, the TV or the movie theatre. So that's really interesting because also, do you feel now that this film has been made, it's been celebrated, it's admired, it's reviewed by its peers and it's won awards, is there a sense of loss now? Because are you grieving for those mm. characters you created that you made that became mm. so personal to you and so emotionally tied to you? Is there is there almost sort of this grieving process now? And then it's, I know there's other <laughs> things in the pipeline. I know there's other things you'll want to do, but the impact that it's that this film has made, not just on, on you both, but other people too. Uh, I mean, it must mm. feel like a, a sort of a long goodbye. Yeah, definitely. After so many years uh, uh, spent on it, for sure. But I think like any, you know, like any race, like any athlete, again, we'll come back to that because that's, I think, what's made me able to deal with this kind of stuff. It's um, you delve into the passion of kind of how can I make myself better for the next one? And, you know, um, why am I driven to do that? And what does that next one look like? And you know, we only have to sort of spend a couple of days brainstorming mm -hmm. and other stuff or meeting with people or getting into other stories. And before you know it, you're in that world. And that's the beauty of storytelling. You jump into these worlds and you are so immersed um, that it can help deal with that sense of sense of loss. Um, yeah, and I think I think to a certain extent we're ready, we're ready to move on from it because that was a journey that was a weird one because it wasn't really us together it was mine to begin with and Sai came on then he wasn't really credited then you know it, it was sort of a, a challenge a challenging journey for both of us emotionally and and now we can step into this new career together as a team with our own production company and you know, it's like that line in the sand, like, okay, we're ready. You know, I hope you're ready for us because we're ready for this journey together. <laughs> so you said, come on then, give, give us some, give us some go gossip. What, what is next? Yeah. yeah. So, um, so we have three written scripts that we're doing what we call packaging. So getting cast and, and, uh, and, and directors attached to, or some of them have directors already. Uh, so one is set in the Scottish Highlands and it's a psychological thriller uh, set between World War One and World War Two about this married couple that are on the run from what we don't quite know. It's all very mysterious and sort of deals with some mental health issues. There's a, quite quite a bit of action in it, but it's a very uh, a deep emotional journey as well as it being kind of um, an action-oriented 
thriller. Um, so that's one piece we hope to shoot this year. So we've done that as a more contained film so that we can be hands-on with it because we were executive producers as well on All Quiet but didn't get to be as hands-on as we wanted. So now we really want to get, quote-unquote, in the trenches mm -hmm. of filmmaking uh, and be on set every day and really sort of learn the process a little bit more. Uh, so that will be this one. And then we have another one set in Ireland in the Travellers community, which is like the gypsy uh, community uh, in Ireland. And it's a beautiful story of unconditional love uh, between a father and daughter. And, you know, it's kind of based around bare knuckle boxing a little bit as well. And it's a real gritty, think the fighter or warrior, one of those kind of films. Um, mm -hmm. So we have an amazing director for that. Uh, called Richie Smith, who did The Siege of Jarrettville for Netflix mm -hmm. uh, that had Jamie Dornan and Mark Strong in it. So he's very talented. And that's one. And then we have a, an amazing historical epic set in Ghana uh, in 1900 uh, about a queen mother who raises an army of 5,000 warriors to fight off the British. And that's a true story. And so we've teamed up with a lot of people from Ghana and uh, also Nigeria. And we have a, a potential new African partner we're bringing in. So mm. we've got like really diverse. And then we've got uh, a TV series we're developing uh, on the military side um, with some Navy SEALs. Because curiously, a lot of my training buddies in triathlon are actually Navy SEALs because the Navy SEALs recruit from triathlon. Um, so and quite a few of them are actually in the industry. Um, so yeah, we've kind of teamed up to do this military uh, TV mm -hmm. series. So just lots of really exciting mm -hmm. things. I think that's part of the fun of it, right? Because you get an opportunity to just, you know, port yourself into these worlds that you would never have experienced or know much about and you live and breathe them, whether it's, you know, turn of the century Africa or, you know, as the Navy SEALs got started in the beginning of the Second World War, and you just, you, you, it becomes your world for months on end. And it's an incredible form of escapism. That's one thing, I guess. It's an incredible form to, uh, a, a way to learn about how other people coped with undo, you know, insert any challenge that it, you, you, you wish there. And, um, and that, I think, has been really, that's really nice because I think that what, for many careers, people get tired of same old, same old. They're doing, they know what they're doing. They've done it over and over again. It becomes routine. And there's, there's, there's obviously there's competitions or new, you know, uh, uh, circuits and so on. But the essence of what you're doing stays the same. But that really isn't the same in film, even though it, you still need a script and packaging. When you're actually creating worlds or adapting worlds and finding the following these people through their journey, it appeals to that kind of 13-year-old in all of us, right? We go on this journey with them and it's incredibly powerful. And, and being able to connect with people on an emotional level because... If there's one thing I've learned in psychology is that it isn't rational thought that changes minds and hearts, right? It's emotion. And narrative journeys and emotional journeys are far more powerful at getting people to change. It isn't just facts and evidence. And I think that that really has been a big mover for us, a big driver for us, because it kind of keeps that fire burning, right, about what you're passionate about, what you can learn about and so on, and then telling other people about these stories too. See, that's where sport comes in, isn't it? It's, again, it'll always be that wonderful emotional connection that we have with sport and that we love so much about the unpredictability of the outcome of sport. And I'm thinking that the only thing that's missing from that amazing list of stuff you've got coming up is a sporting film. So we need to talk uh, well, more about the American <laughs> Cup comeback. We've got like 10. <laughs> Yeah. No, actually, we have two. We have two amazing sports films that we're plugging that I just forgot to mention, which is kind of ridiculous. <laughs> uh, being on this on this pod podcast, but we're we're working with an amazing runner called Lopez Lemon, uh, who I don't know if you heard of him before, but no. uh, he was a Sudanese lost boy. Um, who escaped, uh, ran barefoot for three days, escaped from rebel soldiers, grew up in a refugee camp, running around the perimeter 30k a day, saw Michael Johnson on a little television when his first gold medal at the Olympics and vowed to do that himself. And so eventually managed to uh, get across to America, was adopted by white parents uh, and ended up running for the USA in the 2008 Beijing Olympics and being the flag bearer and meeting the president. So it's this most uplifting, amazing American dream story. And so we know Lopez, 
and uh, he wrote the most be- you guys have to read his book oh my gosh you must have him on your Sounds podcast amazing. he's the most incredible beautiful soul ever so, and the book is called running for my life and yep. and actually you and know talk was. about what's it really about um outside of the incredible like mind-blowing journey this guy has been on it's about you know that consider all that he's been through the atrocious things that he's seen and experienced in his life and he's the most humble gracious man i think i've ever met and so how do you find a sense of purpose in life when you've gone through that much dark suffering again this is the hallmarks the thematic spine finding meaning in suffering or finding meaning in your work or through love or whatever sandbox that you have and to come out of that not jaded with no chip on your shoulder and just still positive is just remarkable is remarkable and so and then giving back he now obviously goes back to Sudan a lot and to help his neighboring vill- his villages and so on so it's just a heartwarming uplifting story that's really um, amazing and then we have a, we have another story which is more we always love sort of thrillers like born type thrillers you know that are a little bit more sophisticated yeah and so we wanted to write one with a backdrop of sport So we've kind of written half of this script that's really a combination of sort of Black Swan, if you remember that film, the tortured soul of the of the of the top one percent of the one percent against with a sort of a with a thriller type born type feel to it about genetic modification. So it's a uh, and gene doping in sports. So it's a. It's, a, it's all the things that we love. And I think, again, it's not about a sport movie. And none, even Lopez's story is not a sport movie. It's about how sport is an arena that shapes character, that shapes motor, teaches you lessons, forces you, kicks you out of your comfort zone, whether you like it or not. And then you're forced to reevaluate and make sense of the world and piece back together your identity, what you want out of life and how you get meaning from it. And those journeys for us are the most powerful because we can all relate to some extent that many of us are having crises of like, oh, is this what I want to do or what should I do next? Or everyone seems to have a passion. What's mine? I don't know what I want in life. And th- these sorts of questions, these deeper existential questions, which if they wander into philosophy, can get awfully, oh, I can't be thinking about that. Just get on and do it. But if you just scratch the surface a little bit to understand how your values connect with drive, it's really powerful stuff. Um, and so for those stories, I mean, really that we're telling now, they reflect both our athletic and our psychological sensibilities, right? That's where they, that's the DNA of all the stories so that we're writing. So here's a question. Actors talk I, a lot about having to go when they're, when they're in a character role, which requires them to go to a dark place. Um, and some take that method acting um, approach and really go to that deep, dark place and can be impossibly hard to live with during that time. And, you know, everyone's on that journey with them. When when you two are writing and you have to go to a dark place, does it change you as people? Does it change the dynamic in your relationship? Are you able to switch in and switch out? I mean, how do you sort of make that work? Mm. You know, I think because we've been married for so long, we know each other's Mm. little... Oh, choose your words carefully <laughs> <laughs> yeah we know each other's little ways I mean I would say that my exercise and my sport is a way to rebalance if I'm at all out of balance uh, I only have to go and work out for a couple of hours and all of a sudden everything's tempered for me um, or I can self-analyze or just see things in a different light um, and then I equally know when sort of size and the writing phase what that might look like you know he literally when we've written scripts he's sat there with you know like a blanket over his head and when he's really into it you know and he's writing all hours of day and night it's just you know I'm not really gonna be able to connect with him you know and that's fine you know I get it I want him to be in that space because that's how we come up with great stuff so and you just know you'll come out at the other end uh, and we'll have those moments together again. So I think it's just knowing each other's personalities and when you're both in different phases of that and just kind of being supportive rather than being combative. Um, and I think that that ultimately comes down to ego, right? And mm. if you don't feel confident in your mm. relationship and you need your own ego massaged by your partner because you're feeling left out, you don't feel like you're getting the attention that you need or any one of those things, then that's when the, the you know, you're going to um, have arguments. But I think because we appreciate each other's 
own ways of doing things mm-hmm. and we can kind of stand back a bit then you know because we don't you know we have an unconditional love for each other so it doesn't feel like we need to you know and I, and I know if Sai is like really in need of help or I am or I'm being vulnerable or he is and we we step up to the plate and say okay babe what do you need you know and 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 that's how we've kind of gotten through all of the the tough times um, plus drugs and alcohol of course I mean that, that's not just not being on the bush for this <laughs> No, we're not for Leslie. God, no. she doesn't even drink. It's like, right. it's like me living... is chocolate. <laughs> <laughs> what did I? What did I do on Sunday night? The Oscars. I just found chocolate yeah, and it ate. Was, it was a chocolate nose bag day. I think <laughs> is the you know clips around you your ears and it. in you, you go. You deserved every bit of that piece of chocolate that you devoured. <laughs> Absolutely. So in a film of your life, because I think your life is a film. Your life is a film. This is this is one waiting to be made in itself. Who plays you? I've often asked Ben this. If they made a story of the America's Cup comeback, comeback tale of 2013, who would play him? And I'm asking you the same question. <laughs> Good question, man. I mean, some of my most favourite actresses sort of around my age category. You've got your Jesse Buckley's... Um, she's one of my favourite actresses of the moment. Um, I love Florence Pugh. Uh, just anyone that, that isn't afraid to sort of be gutsy, I suppose, mm-hmm. yeah. and show that vulnerability, right? And there's some... God, there's some amazing actresses mm-hmm. right now. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a great Scottish actress that I'm getting the pleasure to meet this week called uh, Karen Gillan. Oh, and, yeah, uh, she's amazing. She's done yeah. some... She's mm. incredible, so I'm very excited about that. So I reckon she'd be pretty good, actually. She, we, we don't look too dissimilar, so you never know. <laughs> Watch this. Can she face. run? <laughs> she can, can do she everything. Run? She's hilarious yeah. too, so I'm sure she can. Okay. Yeah, and 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 like most actors on uh, who say, you know, can you do whatever the question is? Yes, I can do it. Can you can you skateboard, yeah. juggling chains? So absolutely, <laughs> yeah. I can do it. Right. <laughs> Exactly, exactly. It seems like you guys have got exactly that approach, which is perfect for this world. Um, In terms of performance, because it's called a Performance People podcast, we like to get from our guests a little tidbit that people can take away and and run with, quite literally, or cycle or swim with, depending on whether you're going to be a triathlete or not. But can you give us something, each of you, that would be a good thing that people can do to apply to their everyday lives just to perform that little bit better in an everyday sense? Maybe, Sai, you go first. Oh, I was going to go first. Go on, you oh, go. You, you go, go first then, right, Leslie. You, go first. You, you two decide. Okay. okay, okay, okay. So mine is an alter ego. That's been my biggest thing that I have hung my performances around. Because I think as a youngster, I really lacked a lot of confidence. And I was so worried about what other people thought and the expectations on my mm-hmm. shoulders. And really the only way to move beyond that was to adopt an alter ego. Um, And many people do it, in fact. And and, and most people kind of do it anyway naturally. But once you define it a little bit, you work in it like a project, then it can really help you. Um, So for me, it was utilizing my acting background to create this alter ego and find behaviors, find sayings, find looks and stances and lots of different ways to achieve this person I felt I needed to be on the start line. And, um, you know, because you need to, certainly in my sport of Xterra, which is off-right road, you really need to commit. You need to be quite aggressive with your level of commitment. You can't half-ass it. So um, I started to create an alter ego based on Conor McGregor, the MMA fighter, because I'm secretly, um, I, I would love to be an MMA fighter. That's my sort of secret thing. But anyways, um, yeah. look out, Simon. <laughs> God, yeah, I can't sorry. face it anymore. <laughs> it's exhausting. <laughs> so what I loved about Conor McGregor, you know, whether mm-hmm. you like him or don't like him, um, the point is, is that he doesn't care what anyone thinks. And again, this might be his alter ego, mm-hmm. right? But he has this unbridled confidence, the way he holds his shoulders, the way he walks into a room, the way he faces people. And there was a certain sort of, um, there were certain aspects of his his personality and his stance and his behaviours that I thought, maybe I should start to mirror that and see if I can adopt it. Just by being it, I can adopt it, adopt that mindset. Uh, and so, yeah, I kind of created this whole character um, called Paddy McGinty. 
Um, you know, sort of a costume for Paddy, a, a stance for Paddy, mm-hmm. a stare, like these certain things that could trigger this air of kind of, I don't give mm-hmm. an F. Um, and I really practiced it a lot. Um, and then I started to adopt it in training. And then during certain training sessions, if I was having a bad day, there, you know, I'd have all of these triggers that could bring about Paddy. Um, and, and that, you know, uh, uh, I was able to sort of then put that into my race performance. And in fact, in our book, we put together an alter ego kit where you can mm-hmm. create your own. So, you know, get pictures, get videos and music and all of these sensory things that can help you get into the space. And so I can kind of talk about the science behind actually why that helps your brain, because this is really cool, I think. Well, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, it's not just dress up, make believe. There's now some really compelling neuroscience evidence about why imagining yourself or thinking about yourself as a third person, it really helps your brain biochemistry for stress, for pain tolerance, for confidence. And many athletes, um, the trouble is that they see there the thing that's stopping, that they see it in the way, whether it's temperament or personality wise, getting in their way of their greatness or excellence is this huge bait, this thing at the base of a mountain. Which, oh, I don't know how I can ever do it. And well, what about if you just faked it? Right. So, so faking till you're making it is an evidence based statement now. There's lots of great evidence to say so. And it's really upended how psychology is done because we always thought that if we have to start with how you think and we change that, that will affect how you feel and then you'll start to act more, blah, blah, blah. And now you can reverse engineer it. So, even if you're rotting inside and scared shitless and nervous and then feel impostering, uh, you can put on these behaviors, uh, exert these behaviors, and you can shift that mindset fairly quickly. So it's really interesting. The, the, the psychological term is embodied cognition, but it's a, a really compelling sort of psychological... And you, we know in therapy, right, you talk to the puppet or imagine if you were standing here, what do you say to your brother, eight-year-old self? Or, so there's been a long history of that in sport. So yeah, it's a really powerful technique. And I did it when I, I'm an introvert and I had to start teaching 300, 500 students. And it was a, a dreadfully nerve-wracking experience. And so you fake it. You You all the, you, the people you admire, public speakers, you <coughs> imitate their cadence of speech, their posture, and lo and behold, you start to believe it yourself, and it turns you into something, or it certainly improves your skills. So it's a really, yeah, it's a really powerful technique. Leslie, when did Paddy McKinty last came up, come out? Oh, probably Sunday. last night in the bedroom. <laughs> oh, sorry, this is a PG show. <laughs> Kidding. <laughs> Mm. Um, actually throughout this process you know the whole award circuit um, because you know this is my first foray and all of a sudden I was catapulted up into this stratosphere I could not Mm -hmm. have imagined being in in my wildest dreams and I ended up um, being part of a writer's panel at the Santa Barbara Film Festival which is a really famous film festival and on this panel were the biggest writer directors in the world. And I was sat there going, like I walked out on stage. I didn't really understand. I didn't realize the magnitude of the event until I arrived there. And I'm speaking to, oh, there's Tony Kushner. Oh, mm-hmm. there's Martin McDonough. Oh, there's Ryan Johnson, who just did Glass Onion. Um, you know, and then uh, who's the Nobel Prize winning? Oh, yeah, the Japanese author. The Japanese author that wrote uh, Living, Mm -hmm. who's a Nobel Prize winner. And it was just, like, lined up on the stage, Todd Field as well. And I'm like, oh, my God. And I'm sat there just going, oh, this is my first film. You know, and I thought, no, shoulders back, engage with the audience, Mm -hmm. be authentic. Um, You know, you know, doesn't matter what people think of you, just believe that you had, you you know, you have the right to be here and, you know, all of those things. Mm-hmm. And, yeah, that's definitely when Paddy came out. <laughs> and where did the name come from? Because, I mean, when you're asked of sort of what would your porn name be, it's sort of, isn't it, your mother's your mother's maiden name and your first cat's name or something? <laughs> yeah. Which, which, makes, which makes me Bagpuss Harding, which is a bit worrying. <laughs> oh, that's Oh, that's amazing. <laughs> yeah. Oh, I think mine was Penny right, Clar- Jack- Cl- Clarendon. <laughs> That's quite good. That's um, right. That's but nice. pa- Paddy doesn't sound like a good one, does it? Um, but it actually, so Paddy McGinty is is the full name, 
And it was actually my coach in San Diego called Vince Fichera, um, that that he called it, I don't know where we got McGinty, but we called it like my heart. You know, I have a big heart when it comes to racing and training. I'll just get stuck in. And Cy calls it like the lockjaw. You know, if I'm on your wheel on the bike, you're not getting rid of me. You know, you'll have to kill me first kind of a thing. And so my coach would call it getting your McGinty on. So he would always say, right, Les, you've got to get your McGinty on for the session. And it kind of spawned out of that, I think. Even although that's an Irish name and I'm Scottish, but I don't know. It was more him that started it. <laughs> it's good. Whatever reason, it's good. And and Cy, what about you? For uh, We go back to this performance tip piece because that's where we started and then we went off on a Paddy McKinty storyline. But in, ter in terms of better everyday performance, what would be a, g a great place to start for people as far as you're Yeah, concerned? I mean, there's probably, oh my gosh, there's lots. That w But ones that I think, because um, it's funny, because in sports psychology, people come to you with a usually a specific problem, nerves, anxiety or confidence, and they, they want a sort of a quick silver bullet fix as though, you know, you could teach topspin tennis serve in like, five minutes and then be world class at it so they all take some practice but there are a few I've learned a few toolbox uh, tricks that work very quickly and I think the starting point is that how we think and feel is largely determined by our nervous system right so uh, the, our internal experience um, is still at a property of our physiology and in fact mind and body are no longer considered to be separate things they're kind of one and uh, one and the same and so calming your self for performance uh, becomes starts with an exercise in calming your physiology and some new neuroscience has found that there are a couple of breath techniques that work within 15 to 20 seconds um, to calm you down very very quickly and we now know the neural pathways of why this works and and so on and so I kind of have a few of those one is called physiologic sigh breathing if you're familiar with Andrew Huberman the, the yep. Stanford neuroscientist who's well is a big proponent of this and their lab in at Stanford and it's one where so at any time you're going into some big thing that you want to be the best version of yourself for it doesn't have to be sport it could be a big presentation it'd be going into you know break up with somebody or ask for a pay rise anything that you're kind of your shit and bricks about and you just really want to okay, I need to remember, I need to have my wits about me. And so it just involves you breathing in through your nose twice, one on top of the other. I'll, sh I'll show you what it looks like in a moment. And then holding your breath for the same amount of time as those two in-breaths. And then breathing out for double the length of the in-breath. So it sounds like kind of a weird convoluted explanation. But each phase of this is really physiologically and neurologically important for this reaction to calm yourself down. So it looks like this, you're going... <sighs> And if you do that twice, three times after three times, you don't get much more of a benefit. You are giving your nervous system a fighting chance of having your skills come out that are hopefully well practiced and already there. The memory, the things that you need to remember on the day and say in the right order will have a better chance of coming out. Because when we get nervous, when this fight or flight response comes, we narrow our attention narrows quite drastically. Uh, cortisol and adrenaline, all these other fight or flight uh, uh, neurotransmitters and hormones ramp up, which is great for performance, but they can come at a price. And so we all become unglued by our strengths, not our weaknesses, actually, which is quite a strange thing, counterintuitive thing to say. So the things that make us who we are also are the things that unglue us. So if you're a very driven, dedicated person like Leslie, you know, you become almost obsessed and almost, you know, they're prone to addiction and all the other things that we know that these very driven people are like. So if you can control your physiology quite quickly, that's really important. And then that's also a way to do the other big thing, which is being learning to stay present in the moment and not being a, your brain. We've been cursed and blessed with a, a frontal cortex that can time travel. We can imagine things that have never happened. Uh, with all that we want to happen and it's often the death of a performance artist athlete or otherwise and so learning to be able to say what's important for the next two minutes to be the best version of myself possible and focusing on outcomes or goals that are not necessarily about the performance itself they're about the process of what I need to do and so we have this exercise or I have when you ask someone to tell us okay tell me what it takes to be really excellent in your sport and they'll list, you know, one or two things. And then you send them a chessboard. I do. This is my exercise. You're 64 squares. Okay, I want you to write and fill up every square 
with something that you can do to be better, quarter of a percent better tomorrow or next week. And that thing that you write in there has to be measurable. So you have to know at the end of the thing whether you did that or not. And they get to about, you know, square 17 and they're like, okay, make sure that I've got custom shoe or whatever it happens to be. They're going into the weeds and they run out of steam. And the exercise is teaching them because what you're really doing is training a process focus to see how that in no matter what the circumstance, there's always one part that you can control. It might just be effort and attitude, but then there's always something you can control. And sticking to those at all costs um, is the way that you have great performances. And so I think that it's a combination. Of, it's really difficult to do that, be present in the moment if your nervous system is so jacked up. So those things in combination are really important. And that's where it leads into things like meditation is also incredibly helpful for athletes. Never mentioned they've graded M word because their eyes will roll back in the head and they'll tell you. So you have little ways of talking about the, the essence of what meditation is and why it works without mentioning the word meditation. <laughs> God, I find all of that so fascinating. That that little bit of um, info comes at a time in my life where I can really apply it. I found myself the other day in the back of a cab and for no apparent reason getting a little bit of a panic attack. And it's completely not who I am as a person and I couldn't attribute it to anything. And the same thing happened to me in the dentist chair about three weeks ago when I felt I had to get up off the seat, which I would never, I normally would say, just pull yourself together. What the hell do you think you're playing at? And instead, for some mm-hmm. reason, I have no idea where it's come from, but this anxiety play is becoming a, a bigger feature, mm-hmm. which never was a feature before. And I've dealt with so many more adverse situations than that. I don't know where it's come from. And I, I it, so that, those that techniques that you've just spoken about, for me, that's a little bit of gold dust actually to take away. But- so I've, I've really found personally, because I dealt with a lot of anxiety and depression and panic mm-hmm. attacks um, throughout my my career and especially with different health issues. And I think the most important thing to understand about these responses is that they do have a physiologic component. Um, yes, it can be social, environmental, historical, all of those things combined, but the fact that they have a physiologic component is understanding what in your physiology could potentially be causing those outbreaks. And so I've been down a a very long path with a lot of different, what we call over here, functional medicine or root cause medicine doctors, getting to the root cause as to why you have the symptoms that you do. Is that symptom anxiety, panic attacks, depression? Is it mm-hmm. a sore stomach? Is it a, is it a hormone issue? Whatever it is. Um, and what you find is that there's many things going on in your body physiologically that we, we, we might not know about. And, of course, there's a huge movement towards understanding things like the gut microbiome and the, the gut-brain axis. Um, and some of my most profoundly anxiety you know anxiety driving driving moments were when I had very very bad mm-hmm. stomach um so digging into other things that might be going on in your body to mm-hmm. impact that not to say that there isn't again mm-hmm. you know genetic issues you know social issues but it is it, I guess my point is is that your body is a system and whether you're looking at it to improve performance or improve health or well-being or joy or life in general is looking at every single piece of it. Um, And again, I think probably that's why storytelling Mm. we're gravitating towards now because we have so much experience in lots of different fields, as you can probably tell, Uh, whether that's health and wellness, whether that's psychology, whether that's the people that we interact with through sport and through our other careers, um but yeah and 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 it's something that we want to i love talking about it because i want to share with people hey and listen if you need help with that let me know uh (laughs) it's very common i'm on the next plane to la to see both of you (laughs) there's a great thing for panic too um and the the science of panic and ptsd as well is really interesting but as a a slight aside so one of the great strategies that's also coming out of neuroscience is your eyes we know that, you know, we all know that 80% or whatever the statistic is that of information is processed through our eyes, but your eyes are a little window to your fight or flight response as well, because your eyes are actually part of the back of your eyeball. It's called the neural retina. It's part of brain. It's indistinguishable from brain tissue. They only pop out of your skull, you know, in the, 
in, in, in utero. And so there are these neurological hotlines to amygdala and all the fear detection centers. And when we get stressed and nervous, it's really interesting what happens to our focus. I mean, our visual focus and our visual field. And so there are these inbuilt mother nature designed mechanisms to calm us down that we have studied in animals and humans, but we never do them volitionally because we just, you know, they're built into us naturally. And one of them is called self-generated optic flow. And so when you, and this is now actually the basis of this method has become a core treatment of post-traumatic stress disorder. The actual, one of the, the techniques is called EMDR therapy, eye movement desensitization and reprocessing therapy. And it's an evidence-based therapy. It's really, really powerful. But for everyday people who aren't PTSD-ish, or they're just nervous and anxious, or they're feeling panicky, is that when you are feeling stressed or you'll be able to have the hindsight, the, the, the foresight to recognize that you're in this moment and you're spiraling down, is to force your eyes to track from left to right and right to left across the horizon and move your body through time and space. And all this means is that you're walking, moving through time and space, and you're scanning the horizon. You know, you're looking left and right, not up and down, not at a phone, not at something small, not foveating to some little thing that you can focus on. You're broadening, and it's important that it's a horizon-seeking lateral visual tracking. And when you do that, you're, all of these neurological and neurons get activated to, car, to really tell these fear centers, we've got this, don't worry. And the evolution, the biology of that makes sense because we're means that we're probably escaping or running away or something, we're getting safe. But So when you practice these behaviors, the physiologic side, weird little nasal breath with those scanning eye movements, you can really calm yourself down. So when you're in an environment which, uh, which will be very stressful, I'm sure you'll, you will be Ben next year, uh, <laughs> uh, is that you're in a team environment, things are going bad, you see some people spir- spiraling. One way is to give them little tools like this, horizon tracking. You can do all this, teach this in 15 to 20 seconds. They're inc- all the little breath. They're incredibly powerful for resetting your nervous system. Formula One drivers do this all the time when you have 100 milliseconds to know whether someone's in your rear mirror or not. You don't have much time to process it. You have to have little things that you can do in the moment that you don't have to sit, lie down and play Enya and listen to a drumming circle. Fucking that won't work, right? So <laughs> things that you can do in the moment when you're stressed. This is why Navy SEALs now teach that are taught surgeons public speakers they're really powerful you got that uh, darling that's fascinating (laughs) yeah yeah i've I've learned more in the last hour i think about this topic than um, in a lifetime so yeah that's exactly how i feel i feel like we need you both in our lives moving forward i'm not sure i can get through tomorrow without either of you in my life It's been so brilliant to listen to both of you and everything you've had to say has uh, has been really fascinating. Thank you so much for coming on. Really, really appreciate it. Yeah, thank you. Our pleasure, both of you. Super fun. Thank you so much for having us. Wow. Let's try and dissect that because that was, I think, quite possibly, we've had some incredible people on this pod, but that uh, that was a fascinating discussion. And, you know, Leslie, with all of her, you know, experiences in, 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 in sport and triathlons, Simon and his expertise in psychology and sports psychology, and then bringing, pulling that all together with the success they've had, and now most recently in Hollywood. Um, I mean, that's quite unique, really, isn't it? And some, some amazing lessons, life lessons to take forwards. But what, what was your big takeaway? Well, I think your reaction's kind of interesting because we've spoken a lot about sports psychology and the benefits of that and applying that to your world over the years. And you've always been pretty reluctant about it and quite a skeptic. And in fairness, I think I have been too. Um, we've just both thought, sort of thought we could just get through pretty much anything. Um, and, and, that's, and that's been the approach to date. But listening to Simon, my God, he has like blown my mind with what he's had to say. Um, and, and Leslie, I love them both. They're both extraordinary people, aren't they? And I definitely want them in my life moving forward. But it's, you know, what they've done is extraordinary. But now having spoken to them, you can see how they got there. Um, it's, it's all been part of the bigger story, hasn't it? Their, their success is absolutely deserved and it comes from a very particular place. They're extraordinary people in their own right and an extraordinary couple. Yeah, incredible. And there's some great tips there. I mean, let Leslie and her alter ego, the, the Paddy McGinty, who sounds like an uh, interesting character. And and Simon, you know, talking about rebasing when the chips are down, things aren't going well, how do you bring yourself back uh, to a, to an even, even keel, even focus? So, 
yeah, plenty to plenty to take away from that. Good life lessons. Yeah, thank you for watching and or listening. Uh, this has been Performance People. We are Georgie and Ben Ainsley. And remember, from what we've learned today, channel your inner Paddy McGinty.